Happy Easter, everyone. Just going to welcome you on this uh, holiest of Christian holidays. Um, as promised, I want to talk about the resurrection. Uh, now, if you've been brought up in the West, uh, whether Protestant or Catholic, uh, chances are you know, you've been brought up with this um, idea uh, about the uh, crucifixion and resurrection and in what it means for the atonement. Uh, this idea called the substitutionary atonement. Um, the idea being that um, uh, that we are all wicked and sinful, born into original sin, and as such deserve to go to hell uh, because God is perfectly just. But because God is merciful, he offered his, his own son as a perfect sacrifice to stand in our place, uh, to take on our sins as if they were his own, and then be resurrected, etc. Um, yeah, uh, and and this, if this sounds a bit absurd to you, I'm quite in agreement. Uh, but you should know that this is not a biblical doctrine, but rather a medieval doctrine created by uh, Anselm of Canterbury in the 11th century. Um, basically, Anselm wanted to, uh, be, being a sort of, being in the, in the scholastic tradition of people like Aquinas, he, he wanted to create a rational defense of Christianity. So he wanted to rationally prove why God had to incarnate as Jesus Christ uh, and, and be crucified and, and resurrected. Um, you know, and and so uh, and so I created this model to say why the, why the incarnation was necessary, and then, um, but you know, I mean, what's interesting about it is it, is it actually seems to be more about the res the crucifixion than about the resurrection. I mean, really, uh, it kind of creates Jesus on the cross as the ultimate symbol, and then the resurrection is sort of a surprise that comes afterwards to say, oh, by the way, there's there's life after death, but. Uh, um, you should know that this is not, you know, the undoctrine of the early church. Um, the early church believed in, oh, the, the, the sort of crude form of it is termed the ransom theory, um, which is that Christ's death was a ransom paid to Satan for the souls of mankind, that Satan was sort of holding people, holding humanity hostage to sin, and, and that, and that, but that, and so Christ died, you know, and was buried, and then and then there was the hell, you know, descent into hell, but hell could not contain his light, and so he brought the souls of, of the dead into, um, you know, into the light through his resurrection, and achieved victory over sin, death, and Satan. Now, this, this could be a bit problematic for a lot of people, too, um, except that, uh, in, in, uh, you know, Athanasius, I mean, Anselm was, um, aware of this of this doctrine and rejected it. And I think that's because as sort of a Western scholastic, he, he interpreted this uh, in a rather literalistic, rationalist fan fashion and couldn't rationally make sense of it. But uh, what you have to understand is that it was not men meant in, uh, you know, rational, literalistic terms. It was meant to be interpreted in a mythic way, whereas and uh, Anselm's view was le was legalistic. It was based on the laws of the time. This this idea of uh, this legalistic idea of justice, whereas this model, which in uh, has in the twentieth century come to be known as Christus Victor, um, after the book by um, uh, uh, by Gustav Aulen, was is the guy's name. Um, uh, basically, it's uh, it's understood as an epic saga of God's victory over sin. Think of it almost as kind of the uh, Star Wars view of the atonement, you know, with sort of blowing up the Death Star of sin, death, and Satan. Uh, um, so, I mean, it, it's, it's understood. So, uh, think of that in terms of the epic uh, saga uh, language. Now, okay, so so it's victory over sin, death, and Satan. So what, what does this mean? First, let's talk about victory over sin. Um, it, the the view of sin in this uh, in this view is is not the way the Anselm viewed it. It's not something that 
it's not that okay we're we're evil and bad people and deserve to go to hell no it's rather it's a force that binds us and keeps us from god it, we are chained by our sin it, there are, there are shackles that bind us to you know, to self-loathing and remorse and guilt and all this you know shameful sense that you know i mean and, and realistic isn't isn't that the way that we relate to sin in our own lives isn't that how we feel about you know, our our wrongdoings? And so, you know, what what the resurrection does for that is, it it offers us a new way of life, a new way to live in to die unto ourselves and live a new life under Christ. And um, so, and so the next part is victory over death. Now, obviously, people people still die, even the most pious among 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 people. So. But obviously, it mean it doesn't mean that we're actually we're literally going to live forever. Um, and, and in fact, if you look to the Eastern Orthodox Church, which actually still holds to this original doctrine, um, their their doctrine is not they don't even uh, you know focus on on the idea of the of an immortal soul as we think of in the West. It's not it, in the West we have this idea that we have this immortal soul that survives uh, death of the body and is judged by God and goes either to heaven or hell. Uh, in 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 your sort of orthodoxy, it's more that um, you know, they they emphasize that God alone is eternal. And um, you know, say they say that you know the wages of sin is death. Well, in a sense, that's true. But sin is sort of what keeps us from God, and and uh, but by but through the resurrection, we are offered a way called that, and the Orthodox Church is called theosis, uh, where we achieve our, where we realize our oneness with God, and realize, yeah, and and by abiding within God and and in our divine, in our own divine nature, uh, we uh, realize that which is eternal here and now, and thus. You know, that which dies with our body isn't you know is not our true self our true self is God and um, and that never perishes so um and you know I mean this the theosis of course is another concept that's been sort of lost in the Western in Western Christianity um, you know we uh, and basically it's the best summed up by Saint Athanasius when he says that um, God became man so that man can become divine. Well, and so, okay, so the third part is victory over Satan, and this probably is the the biggest block for a lot of people, because you know, a lot of people are, are able to believe in God, but to to say believe in Satan is you know, cer certainly among the more uh, liberalized children of the Enlightenment. The idea of Satan is real is real bothersome, but yeah, I, mean, that's, I think that's only if we if we take Satan as a, a sort of this literal um, entity with you know, horns and the yeah, the pitchfork stuff. Uh, we we have to you know go back and think of um, you know, the origins of the idea of Satan. Um, the the word Satan comes from the Hebrew Hashatan, meaning this the adversary. You know, another term for Satan is the accuser. Uh, basically, we can think of Satan as that that force which binds us to our sins, to our lesser nature, to petty, to pettiness and uh, victimhood, and also you know an external force of oppression and um, you know things, the the social sins of poverty and persecution, oppression. It, uh, so it's both external and internal and external um and so God offers us a way out of that you know both internally through realization of our uh, of our divinity and living uh, dying unto our worldly self and living a new life in Christ uh and then externally through uh we we realize that this vision of God as liberator which yeah I mean that that's that's really the really beautiful part of this doctrine is ra rather than um, you know, the the substitutionary model, which treats um, which treats the death and resurrection almost as kind of an exception to Jesus' teaching, it's the sort of break from 
his teaching of compassion and radical inclusiveness and the kingdom of God. Um, instead, this is sort of the culmination of that teaching and you know, the fulfillment of, of it. Um, it te um, we realize God as liberator of mankind, um, but that doesn't mean God will liberate mankind on his own. I mean, you know, taking a process view, we, we, we uh, discard the idea of God as some omnipotent being who can just intercede whenever he wants and realize that we have to do God's work. And in doing that, we have to bring about the kingdom of God by helping to end the, to abolish these social sins, by um, living sustainably with, our, with the earth, by uh, treating one another with, with dignity and respect, and helping realize the kingdom of God by abolishing poverty and um, living a new life of love and respect for one another. That That is the kingdom of God. And you know, that was realized through Jesus' life and in the resurrection, we, we, we are called to rise with Jesus and uh, realize that kingdom of God on earth. I mean, now, this was, you know, that's why uh, the, the Christus Victor model was particularly influential on um, uh, the liberation theology movement uh, in, in Latin America and, and around the world. I mean, there have been there have been extensions of liberation theology you know, in sort of black liberation theology and also in queer theology where gays realized their, their and the LGBT community realized that was their liberation. Because remember that, you know, Jesus taught, you know, associated himself with the most marginalized group groups in, in, in his world. And so in, in this day and age, wouldn't that include the, the LGBT community? I mean, there's been a lot of videos today um, lately about um, transgendered people and um, you know if, if I can think of any more marginalized group yeah, that, that it'd be transgendered people and uh, that's where I think Jesus would most likely be present in in trying to uh, affirm their dignity um, and so you know the um, I, I think that uh, you know the resurrection. We are not. We, we shouldn't think of it as so much as some historical event, some claim of, of history that uh, you know, you know about what happened two thousand two thousand years ago or whatever. Um, rather, it, it's it's a present mystery to be lived out in our own lives. We, it's not Christ was risen. It's Christ is risen. And we have to to live in that mystery and um, realize the risen Christ within our own lives, and experience that call to a new way of life. It's it's new way of life and a new relationship with God. We're called to remember our eternal nature and live God's kingdom in our own life. So, thanks for listening. Happy Easter. Peace.